Are we actually shooting it? Just a few minutes? Okay. Hmm. One ring to rule them all, one ring to Tudor is a game of intrigue and history and these kind of unsettling hands which are necessary to hold your rings of power. But don't let it fool you, beyond the periphery lies a really clever and fresh take on worker placement as well as more variability than you can shake a cardboard appendage at. So today we're taking a closer look at Tudor by Academy Games. The core to King Henry VIII is a bit like modern bureaucratic infrastructure, except for the head of the org chart happens to lob off people's heads. Tudor is a worker placement game that central mechanics are carousel of meeting rooms filled by your workers that are only meaningful if accompanied by a supervisor. These are your workers who are taking actions which support your other dudes in the other main focus of the game. Courtiers moving in the courtroom in a sort of renaissance era convention, networking tirelessly until they might eventually be given a title for themselves. Players each start with two rings which are placed on the cardboard hand on fingers of their choice. Placement of the rings confer bonuses at the different worker placement spots in the game, and the placement of your rings can only be changed if and when the number of rings you control changes. Every turn, players deploy new courtiers to sit outside of the three meeting rooms, then after everyone's placement, they move into those rooms, making room if necessary by pushing out courtiers who have been there the longest. These workers remain in the rooms for the duration of the game unless they too are pushed out. But wait, workers can only be activated if a lord is present, so after meeples move into rooms, players place their one lord who is only in that room for this round. Once meeting rooms are all set up, players rotate taking actions by activating their courtiers or lords. Courtiers take their choice of either the top or bottom action of their room, whereas lords take both of these actions at once. Courtiers without lords don't activate at all this round, because without supervisors they have no authority and are probably browsing Reddit. Actions generally come down to taking new courtiers and placing and moving them in the courtroom, or getting cards and rings that are going to allow you to do the placement and movement of the courtiers in said courtroom. See these tiles here? They correspond to the seven different factions, which are the seven different cards and the seven different rings, and depending on whichever action you take, you're either going to need to discard cards or have corresponding rings for each of the different faction tiles that you move onto. As I said earlier, if you have rings on certain fingers, you get bonuses from the different spots. So if you have rings on the middle three fingers, you can use the A action in order to move to any spot regardless of what color ring that you have. Or if you have rings on every finger but the thumb, when you use the E action and you move at least three spaces, paying cards as required in order to move through those spaces, then you also get a card of your choice after the action is completed. But why are you doing all of this. Well, the most obvious reason is that as long as you make your courtier's way to the top of a column, then you actually assume the office associated with that column, allowing you to get a ring from the supply, or better yet, if there's already someone that you're bumping out of that office, then you're actually getting to take a ring from the opponent who previously held it. And not only that, but every single space that you move through, well, you get to have all of the tokens associated with those spaces. And the final space that you land on, on any given action, you get to take the special action token. And then only the faction tokens that were taken get randomly refilled. But why any of this matters whatsoever really gets to the heart of Tudor. Every game has two different intermediate or end game scoring conditions ranging from collecting sets of faction tokens and scoring points whenever you take an office to end round scoring based off of the most core tiers in each column at the end of every round. Additionally, a third card dictates the number of core tiers players assign outside of the meeting rooms each turn, the number of rounds, and the bonus actions the two different types of special action tokens can be discarded for in the game, ranging from additional movement and banishing core tiers from the courtroom to getting cards of your choice and changing the order of the courtiers in the meeting rooms, making sure that Mrs. TCBH's meeples get bumped first. The three cards that you choose at the beginning of the game are what give it depth. Because while the shifting worker allocation is mechanically interesting, 
all your actions pretty much come down to movement, and that on its own is kind of dull. But suddenly with these three cards, everything has context, and with context comes meaning, and that meaning can change from game to game. Turns become puzzles, tightly balancing immediate tactical advantage and long-term strategic play, and there's a huge amount of player interaction through taking one another's offices, bumping courtiers, even grabbing a host of faction tokens that you know your opponent has been gathering cards to move over, only to have them randomly reset to new colors. And so, while you have a couple core mechanics that are really pretty simple, you end up with a highly interactive game with a ton of decisions to make about where to place your courtiers, where to place your lords, where you're going to move in the courtroom itself, what cards you need to get, what tokens you're going to go after, what rings to get, and where you're going to place them on this hand. And you end up having this feeling that this game is simultaneously both pretty simple but also dense, which can be both a good and bad thing. There are many great things about this game, the questionably intentional dry wit as it brings 16th century bureaucracy to life, the changing parameters including the really fantastic recommended pairings that keep the game fresh, and truly innovative worker placement that feels so clever. On the other hand, there are so many choices on top of choices and they often feel anticlimactic as it all boils down to collecting cards to moving people up the rung. Don't get me wrong, I do like this game, and your choices do matter, but there are a ton of decisions that don't always have obvious answers, and the game kind of feels unlike anything else out there. It takes at least a game to wrap your brain around any meaningful sense of strategy. That said, once players get the hang of it, the game moves surprisingly fast. I like it best as a 2-3 to three player game, as at 4 players, while playable, it feels like a little too many cooks in the kitchen. If there's anything I truly dislike, it's the laughable box art and how much of a novelty the hands and rings feel. They are kind of endearing, and the bonus effects do have an impact, but the art and presentation do a fairly good job misrepresenting what is actually a really nuanced and innovative Euro game. I think this game is worth checking out, especially if you really like worker placement but want something clever and new, want more player interaction out of your Euros, enjoy variable parameters, or are just wanting a sort of dry, dark humor, including grotesque hands, round trackers based on butchered brides, and a first player decided by who looks most like the head-hunting honcho himself, notable lady killer King Henry VIII. So that's it. That's our tutor review. If you are interested or have already played the game, I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald. Bye bye. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.